hobbies are a good thing, generally speaking. But when a hobby becomes an obsession, what was once an innocent pastime can become a sinister fixation. Such can be said of the many treasure hunters obsessed with finding buried treasure on Canada's Oak Island, getting its name from the mysterious forest of oak trees that once grew there and nowhere else in the area. It's cost six people their lives and it's cost many others their fortunes and their sanity. So that's part of what makes it such a fascinating and compelling but in some ways dark story is that it's also about hope and inspiration, you know, surfacing continually, you know, some new group of people with some new theory or some better equipment or improved technology shows up and thinks we can do what's never been done. And they keep making remarkable discoveries, but it's like they still at best have maybe a tenth of some giant jigsaw puzzle and they're trying to figure out where the rest of the pieces are, what the image is. That's Randall Sullivan, author of The Curse of Oak Island, the story of the world's longest treasure hunt. Oak Island is in Mahone Bay, which is just off the south shore of Nova Scotia. It was remarkable for the early settlers only because it had oak trees on it. None of the other many islands in Mahone Bay did. But in 1795, three teenage boys, well, one teenage boy initially, found this anomaly on the island. What first brought his attention was seeing the stumps of old oak trees that had been cut down and new trees growing in what looked like a circular depression in the ground. He became convinced and convinced his friends that there was buried treasure there, which wasn't as far-fetched as it might seem because that area, Mahone Bay, really was a pirate haven during the 16 and 1700s. And they would lay up there and, and basically they, it was where they could keep an eye on uh, the shipping lanes that followed the Gulf Stream from south on the way to Europe. So, and every little bay or inlet there has some story of pirate treasure. Today, historians have pretty much debunked the myth that pirates buried their treasure. Rather, they spent it as soon as they stole it. But treasure hunters in the 1700s, 1800s, and even the early 1900s firmly believed that gold and jewels could be found if they dug in the right place. Those young men started digging hit a layer of flagstone that looked like it had been very carefully laid about three feet down, which convinced them, okay, we're on to something. And they dug down 10 feet and struck wood. And as they were digging, they, it was very soft ground they were digging in, but the walls of this circular shaft were hard clay, so it was clear it had been dug out previously. They hit wood, thought it was a treasure chest, but it turned out to be a platform of logs that were embedded in the walls of the shaft. They tore those out and dug down another 10 feet and hit wood again. Again, we're convinced it was a treasure chest, but it was another platform of logs. At that point, they looked up 20 feet of clay above them and realized it came down, they were dead. So they covered it up and went looking for someone who would finance a more elaborate search. It took the boys time to convince a group of financiers that they were on to something big, but eventually the boys were successful. The first team of financiers hauled tons of equipment to Oak Island in 1795 and resumed digging in the shaft the boys had initially uncovered. And hit more log platforms at 30 feet, at 40 feet, at 50 feet, at 60 feet, at 70 feet, and at 90 feet where resting on the platform was a large slab of stone. They flipped it over and there was carving on it, letters and figures, some sort of a code, a coded message apparently. They removed the stone and that triggered some sort of a flood system, which filled the shaft with seawater. And that flood trap basically blocked expedition after expedition, tried to solve the problem and was defeated by it. But along the way, they found ever more incredible things on the island in terms of the engineering feed, the work that had been done there. No treasure has ever been found. But still, Sullivan and others like him wonder who would go through so much trouble to create such an elaborate system. They figured it must be something of greater value than gold and silver. It never made sense to me that people would have done this kind of work just to bury any treasure, no matter how fantastic, of gold or silver, that it had to be something of sort of deeper, more significant, maybe even religious value. I just don't know how you'd motivate people to have done something like this. And the engineering genius of it is singular as well.
Sullivan says people throughout the years have proposed dozens of theories about who created the money pit. That's the moniker that first appeared in print in 1860, but not because of what was spent exploring the shaft, but rather because of what investors hoped to pull out of it. Some theories seem plausible, while others have been dismissed outright, such as the one that suggests Sir Francis Bacon, the English philosopher, and his followers had something to do with it. However, one theory that has traction with fans is that the money pit was built by the Knights Templar after they were purged from Europe in the 1300s. The Knights Templar was an order established in Jerusalem during the Crusades. Many people believe their great treasures included the Holy Grail and the Ark of the Covenant. Two years ago, one of the things they found on Oak Island was a cross that antiquities experts agree was manufactured in the 13th century. And it matches identically. It's a very unusual cross. It matches exactly something that was drawn on the wall at Don Prison where the Knights Templar were held in the early 1300s before they were executed. Of course, I don't know that it's not Spanish gold or the treasure of Havana or many of the other things that people have suggested it might be, but it just seems to me unlikely that you could get people to put in this kind of labor. I mean, it literally tens of thousands of man hours went into the works on Oak Island. And who was motivated to do that and why is the central question. But I just, what I know about human nature tells me it wasn't to bury gold or silver. The mystery of Oak Island has captured the imaginations of thousands of people throughout history, including a young Franklin D. Roosevelt. He was a member of one Oak Island expedition as a young man and still kept tabs on news and discoveries on the island throughout his presidency. The fascination continues to this day, but Sullivan says irreparable damage to the site from years of expeditions has taken its toll. It was private property. There was no, there were no government agencies overseeing any of this in 1795 or in 1850, for that matter. And a lot of the problem with the search on Oak Island is that expedition after expedition, search companies would form. They would come to Oak Island and they would dig their own shaft on this drumlin, this mound hill on the east end of the island where the money pit is. And then they would try to tunnel to the money pit. And so, I mean, it's just honeycombed with other shafts and tunnels, many of which have collapsed with taking down thousands of board feet of timber that were used to provide a frame for the shaft. So it's a mess down there, and it's really difficult to separate what was there originally from what was left behind by previous treasure hunters. Today, Oak Island is a national historical site in Canada, and the government has archaeological oversight. Sullivan, as do many others, remains convinced that something valuable is down there. Drills have gone down, probes have gone down, cameras have gone down, and they have actually sent down equipment that pulls up pieces of what's down there. For one thing, now the government is involved, and so you have to be very careful about the it, you know, it's a national historical site in Canada, and people are very concerned about what is down there and not damaging it. And so it's got to be approached carefully. And then when you do bring something up, you've got to then determine, is this the original work or is this from a later search team? Carbon dating gives you a range, but you can't really say when this was done. I mean, you know, the carbon dating goes back to the 1400s. And so he and many others believe the money pit is authentic. It is not a hoax. I mean, if it is, it's the most elaborate hoax that's ever been created by the human race because the work really was done. The evidence of that is overwhelming. And the people who found it clearly weren't hoax. They weren't the hoaxers because they sank their lives and their ancestors' descendants sank their lives and fortunes into it too. And they were all looking for treasure. We humans are naturally drawn to a mystery, and so centuries after its initial discovery, Oak Island's allure still has the power to fascinate and draw people from around the world. It's not something you can completely let go of. I mean, I keep following what's going on there because the mystery just sort of tugs at the imagination and, and you never really forget it. The book is The Curse of Oak Island, the story of the world's longest treasure hunt by Randall Sullivan, available now. You can learn more about all of our guests by visiting our website at viewpointsonline.net. Our writer-producer for this segment is Polly Hansen. Studio production by Jason Dickey. I'm Marty Peterson.
Viewpoints returns in just a moment. Paid non-attorney spokesperson paid for by the Sentinel Group. Attention military vets and current soldiers who served between 2002 to 2016. Have you or a loved one suffered hearing loss or tinnitus after serving or while serving in the U.S. Armed Forces? You may be entitled to compensation. 3M, the manufacturer of earplugs made for combat, recently paid the government $9.1 million to settle a False Claims Act case for knowingly selling these defective earplugs for over a decade. Specifically, the United States argued that the manufacturer knew their earplugs were too short for proper insertion into users' ears and that the earplugs could loosen and therefore didn't perform properly or reduce noise the way they should have. If you or a loved one suffered hearing loss or tinnitus after serving or while serving in the U.S. Armed Forces, you need to choose the right legal team that has the experience, support staff, and resources to seek the most compensation for your injuries. Call the Sentinel Group now for more information and a free case review. Call 800-655-6458. 800-655-6458. That's 800-655-6458. Thank you for listening to Viewpoints Radio, a production of Media Tracks Communications. If you enjoyed this broadcast, please support our show by subscribing, sharing it with a friend, and leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. You can find more Viewpoints stories on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, and ViewpointsOnline.net. Also, follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Viewpoints Radio. Coming up next week. I was already very skeptical and thought she was a very dangerous person. The story behind Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes. Then. Lynn Manuel Miranda, you know, the creator of Hamilton, he put it as I have a lot of apps open in my head right now. That's what he likes to say. The benefits of juggling several different passions in life. I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in depth on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. <laughs>